So before we dive right into our discussion of typology, that's chapter seven, different ways of categorizing languages, let's talk about the upcoming schedule. On Thursday, I wanna talk about historical linguistics, and that's really closely related to this concept of um, sociolinguistics that we've been talking about last week, to the concept of typology that we're talking about today, all these different ways of categorizing languages. Next week, what I wanna start getting into is language documentation. There's no appropriate reading in the book about this, um, so I'll put a very short assigned reading on the Moodle that you can uh, browse through. And then I wanna continue that conversation just all, all next week. Okay, as background, um, we talked about a little bit of this, so I won't rehash it entirely. Check the slides on sociolinguistics and stuff if you missed this discussion. But there's really a difficult um, time describing and defining precisely what it means to be a language, what it means to be a dialect. There's always social, political, cultural sorts of baggage that's associated with those terms. When we talk about a language, we're often talking about whatever the standard language is considered to be. And in some places that can be tricky if a language is considered to have more than one standard or if more than one place consider themselves to be the speakers of the standard language even though they all speak slightly differently. And that's what I want to talk about first for a second. As we mentioned, dialect tends to refer to people when we're grouping the same language, people who consider themselves to be speakers of the same language, but uh, different kind of geographical groupings. Uh, one definition that you could say about how, how it is that we can even define a language or tell the difference between two languages is mutual intelligibility, right? We talk about species in biology as being two different types of animals that can't come together and produce offspring, even though that gets to be a little complicated and there's hybrid animals of various kinds. So the issue with that though is that you get these continua, these continuums of uh, chains of dialects where people on one end of the chain may be able to understand people on the other end of the chain not really very well, but links along the way they'll be able to understand a lot more clearly. Also it's sometimes the case that speakers of one language will be able to understand speakers of the other language, but it won't work the other way around. The intelligibility isn't mutual, it's actually asymmetric. Some really good examples of that come out of uh, the Norse languages that we'll talk about in a second. Another issue is the writing system. Because writing is such an important part of people's identities, uh, it can also get tied up in people's definition of language. So if two groups of people speak what we might consider to be the same language, but they have different writing systems, they might consider themselves to be speakers of different languages. So we'll talk about those issues as well. As an example of a sort of a chain of dialect intelligibility, language and dialect intelligibility, Potawatomi speakers typically consider themselves to be speakers of their own language, and they have a word for man that's pronounced nune. In southern Ojibwe, speakers there consider themselves to be speakers of a broad Ojibwe language, and they pronounce their word for man nune. In western Ojibwe and northern Ojibwe varieties, you get something that's more like enene or eneneu, even with a W at the end. So speakers of Potawatomi and speakers of Southern Ojibwe can really easily understand each other, but speakers of Potawatomi and speakers of Western Ojibwe have a much more difficult time understanding each other. On the other hand, Miami Peoria, Illinois speakers, their word for man is Elenewa, and that's a lot closer to Western Ojibwe, but the intelligibility there is asymmetric. As we said, there have become a lot of issues with defining language, especially when we're thinking about the Norse languages, the Scandinavian languages, Norwegian, Danish, and Swedish. In a lot of ways, they're very similar languages. Hey. Hi. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good dog. Good dog. Good day. Tack så mycket. Tusen tack. Mange tack. And it turns out that, of course, they all share a lot of different um, features of their standard writing systems, so they can all pretty easily read each other's languages, but in the spoken language, it becomes a lot more difficult to understand. It's typically the case that Norwegians in the north have an easier time understanding the Swedes and the Danes in the south, and that the Swedes sort of caught in the middle have the most difficult under time understanding either other group. Um, Chinese is another great example of how political the definition of a language is, right? There's really no such thing as just 
Chinese. When we as Westerners think about Chinese, we're thinking actually of a whole bunch of different languages, not dialects, but different, really different languages that aren't even mutually intelligible at all. Chinese as a macro category includes labels like Mandarin, the kind of standard Chinese of the government, but also varieties like Wu, like Cantonese, and a whole bunch of other varieties that are not mutually intelligible with the government's official Mandarin Chinese. Chinese is actually a hugely complex tapestry of different varieties, different words, all sort of more like the Romance language family than a single language, a whole bunch of interrelated languages. Serbo-Croatian tends to be another good example. We as linguists and outsiders consider Serbo-Croatian and Bosnian to all be sort of the same language spoken here as you can see off the Adriatic Sea by Hungary or Romania. However, speakers amongst each other sometimes consider themselves to be speakers of separate languages and there's a variety of sort of political and social cultural reasons that we won't have time to get into here. As we can see, however, this table shows that the words are very, very similar. The sort of differences we see between, for instance, in a word like times or a word like need, uh, the differences between those three languages are very minor. It can be handled by single phonological rules in some cases. But to zoom back to this topic today of typology, what we're really looking at is a difference of perspective. What is your vision of grammar and what is your vision of the science of grammar? This is sort of similar to what we also call in this field the formalist versus the functionalist camps, or those two perspectives. It all comes down to what you want to see as universal about language, but different ways of approaching what that means. Whereas generativists, like we've been studying for the first half of the semester, are thinking about innate universals, things that are innate about your mind that allow you to put language together in the particular structures that we see, and the poverty of the stimulus argument, all those sorts of deductive rational arguments. In the typological perspective, we're going to try to go around the world and look at as many languages as we can in a kind of an empirical way, looking at a more inductive generalization instead of deductive generalizations. We'll talk about a couple of different ways over the next few classes of discussing and describing and categorizing languages. We've talked a little bit about sociolinguistic ways of categorizing languages. That ends up being very closely related to historical linguistics methods, which we'll have to revisit shortly next class. Historical linguistics deals all with the comparative method. How, when you know two languages are related, how are they related? What does that mean? Where did they come from? Those are the sorts of questions we want to answer in historical linguistics. For example, through written documentation, we know that Latin had a word corpus, meaning body, and we can look at the modern Romance languages and see words like cores, like cuerpo, that all clearly descend from this one kind of common source. So how does that happen? The other thing that we see comes with the previous example that I just showed of this Algonquian uh, language's word for man, and it's answering the sorts of questions did this W in Nini get lost or did it get added? And how do you know? There's a clear up and down right wrong answer for this and we'll get into how to find out about it next time. Another type of language categorization that we'll have to take a look at is purely geographical, purely aerial. Because it turns out that when speakers of different languages hang out together for long enough, they not just borrow each other's practices and each other's ways of doing things, each other's foods, they also borrow words. And sometimes it'll be even Stephen and you'll be borrowing the same direction, a couple of different languages, each borrowing from each other in an egalitarian way. And sometimes the borrowing is really asymmetric and it'll be one language borrowing a lot from another language and the other language not borrowing very much at all. But when this sort of thing happens over generations and generations and you get multilingual speakers over many generations speaking different languages together, then you get what we call a language area. And we'll talk about that when we talk about Native American languages, which will be after we talk about language documentation. The typological perspective of looking at language should be pretty familiar to you if you took, for example, biology classes. That's the sort of way that we look at biological species. 
As Carl Linnaeus said, everything it is possible for us to analyze depends on a clear method which distinguishes the similar from the not similar. It sounds complicated maybe, but really all it is is about what is the difference that makes a difference in language. Typology essentially simply the search for universals. What is true or not true in every single language that we have ever known about? You can look for universals, of course, across any domain of language. That's why I like to start the semester thinking about each of those aspects of the structure and then zooming out, because we can do sociolinguistics on any aspect of the structure. We can do typology on any aspect of the structure. This search for universals helps us establish what is possible and establish what is not possible. However, we want to try to be really careful with what we correlate. We don't want to just make random observations about just any two random things. For example, it's probably a true statement that every single language with an animate, inanimate noun class or gender distinction also has the phoneme T. This is probably true, but it just doesn't matter. It probably doesn't have anything to do with the fact that there's an animate inanimate noun class distinction that there's also a phoneme t. That's probably just an accident. The phoneme t is really common. Most languages have the phoneme t. What we're looking for in typology is meaningful observations that aren't just obvious random statistical chance. Something that informs us about language, not just some random facts. A more interesting and more substantial universal that we might study is the observation that every single language that has a first and a second person reflexive pronoun, for example, myself, yourself, those kinds of words, also has a third person reflexive, like himself, herself, itself, themselves. That means we have categories. There are languages that have no reflexive, um, that no reflexive first or second or third persons at all, Right? Like Old English is one of those languages. There are also some languages that only have a third person reflexive. So for example, modern German has, I think, sich. There are also languages with first, second, and third, like English, but there are no languages that have any deviation from that category. Isn't that interesting? Why? That's typology. So one of the uh, most important concepts in typology is the search for absolute versus implicational universals. An absolute universal is just a clear statement that this is the thing that happens in every single language. An implicational universal is something a little more like the if-then statement that we took a look at earlier. In actual practice, we don't find a ton of absolute universals in language, or maybe. We sort of argue about it anyway. But we do see a lot of universal tendencies, right? Something that may not be true 100% of the time, but it's a really, really good bet. Implicational universals, like I said, are this sort of if-then statements. So for example, it's a true fact that if a language has nasal vowels, for example, a vowel like en, then it'll also have oral vowel vowels, an oral vowel version of that vowel. There's a tongue twister. So, so that means that there's languages that have only oral vowels, and there's languages that have oral and nasal vowels, but there's no languages that only have nasal vowels, right? It's also the case that if a language has a glottalized consonant, like t, uh, then it'll also have a non-glottalized version of that consonant. That means there are no languages that only have glottalized consonants or that have a weirdly asymmetric system where you only get glottalized consonants and no non-glottalized consonants in particular categories or something. That would be weird. That would be marked. We use this term marked in a couple of different ways in linguistics, typically to mean something that's unusual or divergent, but it can also mean marking like a plural marker. We talk about markedness in a lot of different ways in language. I know, I know, linguists. So for instance, the difference between car and cars is a difference of a marking, the plural marker, right? Car is unmarked, it's the default, and cars has this extra thing attached to it. Okay, another difference of markedness is cat versus kitten, right? Cat is the default type of feline 
kitten is a special kind, right? It's a small cat only or a young cat or however you use that term. So kitten is marked with respect to cat in that it's not the default form. Also, we can compare two different kinds of plurals in terms of their markedness, cars versus sheep. Sheep is a weird plural, right? Sheep doesn't add anything. You can't tell the difference between one sheep, two sheep. Cars is an unmarked plural because it's a normal plural. It's just the regular old s. Irregular plurals are sort of marked. We should talk a little bit about this guy Joseph Greenberg. He's a very important typologist. Next class we'll talk a little bit more about why he has a really bad reputation as a historical linguist, especially about people, especially among people who know Native American languages. So, uh, but for now, he's a very well-respected typologist. He's known for comparing huge numbers of languages, and often when we're talking about the search for universals and we're talking about linguistic typology, we're talking about Joe Greenberg. There's a couple of extra sources if this is something you're interested in. I'll put the links to them in the PowerPoint. For now, let's start thinking about some universals. In phonology, we could classify languages by sound across all sorts of different axes, right? How many different concepts in phonology did we introduce? All sorts. One thing we could do is just talk about how many sounds there are in a given language. Some languages have a whole bunch of sounds. Some languages don't have very many sounds at all. What is possible in human language? How much diversity can there be? It turns out that there can be very, very small numbers of sounds. Some languages have under 10 consonants, especially Austronesian languages, languages spoken in the islands in the Pacific Ocean. And languages can also have dozens and dozens and dozens of consonants, over 100 consonants, for instance, some of the languages of Southern Africa. In terms of vowels, though, we see some really interesting patterns across languages, and vowel systems have gotten a lot of attention in the world's languages. It tends to be the case that vowels in the world's languages try to be as far apart as possible. I'm anthropomorphizing the vowels, but I'll show you what I mean. A very typical minimal vowel system in a language that doesn't have very many vowels is e, a, and u. You can't get any farther away in the mouth if you're three vowels than e, a, and u. That is the maximal physical distance that you could be apart in the tongue. That is really easy to tell the difference between an e and an a, because that's the most extreme difference there is. If a language has four vowels, they tend to occur in one of two patterns. You either add an e halfway in between the e and the a, or you add an i halfway between the e and the u. If a language has five vowels, you tend to see either both the i and the e, or an e and an a. Again, these maximally contrastive systems. Just to compare, this is what we're working with here in our, up, uh, well, maybe this is my up north kind of English. And we see e, a, and u all maximally far apart from each other. We see e slotted in nicely over there, a slotted in nicely over there. How does this fit in with the sort of sociolinguistics, historical linguistics, language change story we were just talking about over the last few classes? We'll continue that discussion next class. In phonology, we can also take a look at languages and what kind of syllables they allow. It turns out some languages allow all sorts of different kinds of syllables, and some languages have very restricted syllable inventories. Some languages, famously, again, the Austronesian languages of the islands in the Pacific, only allow open syllables oftentimes, or in many positions, many contexts. So you get these wonderful words like humu, humu, nuku, nuku, apu, a, a, that doesn't have a single closed syllable in it. Some languages, for instance, only allow syllables to start with a vowel or only allow words to end with such and such. We can also measure a language or categorize or typologize a language in terms of whether or not it has certain contrasts. So for instance, we talked when we were talking about phonology the first time about vowel length. Some languages have phonemic vowel length, like Finnish. Some languages have allophonic vowel length, like English. I think I might have screwed that up, so I'm just going to say it one more time. Some languages have phonemic vowel length, like Finnish. Other languages have 
allophonic vowel length, like English, some languages don't have vowel length contrasts at all. Some languages, as we mentioned, have or don't have nasal vowels. Also, tone has received a lot of attention. Tone is present in many languages, and within that context of tone, we can also do typology about what kinds of tone systems we see. So Igbo has a wonderful simple kind of tone system where if you get the, um, the acute accent going up is the high tone and the kind of other accent, his name I always forget, going down is the low tone. So if you get low low on this form aqua, it means bed. If you get low high, it's egg. If it's high low, it's cloth. If it's high high, it's crying. The joke among phonologists is there's four words, aqua, and none of them mean water. We don't have very many jokes. That's the best joke we have. In Yao language, spoken in Indonesia, you get only six consonants, so it's a simple language, right? Check out these tones. This is all the same two sounds, be or ba, but in a whole bunch of different tone contexts has a whole bunch of different meanings. In the Kikuryu language, we see something else that some tone languages do. Some tone languages spread tone. So in this case, the underlined red vowel O has the tone, and it spreads to the right up until the end of the word. Some tone languages do this. Some don't. Different category. In terms of morphological typology, we've talked about that already a little bit, so I won't rehash this. But basically, one of the most common ways of doing morphological typology is trying to answer the question, how many morphemes do you get per word on average? A whole bunch? Not very many. Um, so those are where we talked about things like polysynthetic languages. The languages that I work on are, of course, polysynthetic. So Potawatomi has these wonderful words, gjede. It is hot, for instance, something that you could touch, or a room is hot. Gajate, it is hot weather if the sun is shining. If the sun's not shining, you gotta use a different word. Gajabkizo, it's hot metal, some sort of hot inorganic solid like glass or ceramic. Gajabote, it's hot liquid. And in each of these cases, the guj means hot, and you get a little more information from all the other words that you add together. There are some good implicational morphological universals when it comes to uh, morphological typology. So for instance, we've talked about these a little bit already, but if a language has a dual, then it has to have a plural. There's no languages that only have a singular and a dual. And if a language has a trial, that's a special suffix that only refers to three things, then it also has a dual. There's no languages that just have a singular and a trial or a singular and a plural in the trial. If a language distinguishes between different noun classes or genders, then it'll also distinguish number. There are no languages that only distinguish noun class or gender and don't distinguish singular and plural. All sorts of interesting things to search for like that in morphology. Syntax, we talked a little bit also about syntactic typology, word order stuff I won't rehash, SOV, SVO, etc. However, there's also a category in English called prepositions. And a lot of languages have what we call a postposition. A postposition is just a preposition that comes after the word instead of before it. So instead of saying down by the river, you'd say the river by down. And if a language only has suffixes and has no prefixes, then it's going to have postpositions and no prepositions. Semantic typology is pretty interesting as well. We talked a little bit about this when we talked about color words, color typology, those sorts of things. Body part words are another really great example of semantic typology. The human body, for instance, is a continuous spectrum, right? There's no dividing line between my hand and my arm and my fingers. And it turns out to be the case that just like color words, not every language divides the human body in the exact same way. Where does your arm start and your hand begin? Where do your shoulders begin and end? How much of this arm is dedicated to a category called elbow? These categories aren't universal. In Serbo-Croatian, there's a single category that means both hand and arm. It covers everything out to your elbow. In Quechua, there's an extra special category that's different from both arm and hand. It includes just the length from the finger to the elbow. It's like a special word that just means those sorts of, that sort of area.
In Serbo-Croatian, there's a particular special word that refers to the word on a piece of your fingernail, so a kind of a sub-piece of the fingernail. It's also the case that in verbs and in action words, we divide up other concepts in different ways across languages. In English, we use the one verb open to mean open your eyes, open a can, open an envelope, open a box, open a book. Those are all totally different kinds of actions. In Korean, there are six different verbs for those six different senses of open. Anyway, that'll do things for now. That's a brief introduction to typology. Next time we're going to be talking about historical linguistics, especially all sorts of technical concepts like splits and mergers. We discussed these a little bit already in the context of sociolinguistics, but we'll explore them a little bit more technically next time. We'll also talk about the comparative method. The comparative method is a really important piece of historical linguistics in the modern era, and it's the only way that we can make defensible claims about what actually happened in history using language.